This is InfoSec Decoded number 77, Taproot. And we're starting with Irvin, who has discovered that Windows is a disaster. Yeah, right? Who knew? No. Uh, so this article, uh, I think, is more of an <laughs> opinion point. But uh, the very last line is the line that, that made me laugh. Uh, yeah, so with XP, uh, if you all forgot, it lasted 13 years, way beyond what Microsoft wanted it to last. And that was because everybody didn't want to let go of it and they had to keep updating it. Uh, and Microsoft is trying to do that push again uh, with, with 11. Uh, yeah. Windows 10 dies, I think, a year um, in between. Like, there's, this, there's this odd gap of everybody needs to move over. In 2025 is yeah. when Windows will no longer be supported. Right, and people are stuck with either continuing running an unsupported OS, dispose of the hardware and buy a new one, uh, run Linux like uh, Alan is doing. Yep. <laughs> or ignore the warnings and upgrade to 11, knowing that it may not work because it doesn't meet all the requirements that they want for, uh, for Windows 11. Well, according to this, Microsoft tells you that if you override the warnings and upgrade to 11, your 11 won't get updates. Right, right. So that's a lot of people are stuck in a, in a very uh, unfriendly place. But the, the point of this is just watch. You'll see that in a couple of years, Microsoft will release some, some news that says, oh, hey, you unsupported people. Now you can update. That was our plan the whole time. Yeah, or they'll have to keep supporting Windows 10 for more years. I mean, everyone I know in the business has been screaming bloody murder about their stupid hardware requirements for Windows 11. There's mm -hmm. no need for TPM2. It runs fine without it. So what is their malfunction, you know? Yeah. One thing uh, amazed me about this article is this is from Ed Bott. And Ed Bott has been the ultimate champion of Windows forever. I, he's even blocked me on Twitter one time for saying mean things about Microsoft. He's always taking Microsoft's side at every... When you have lost Ed Bott, you have really gone wrong. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, so Irvin mentioned a few ways to fix the problem. And I do want to point out that Microsoft's recommended solution is to buy a new PC, uh, preferably a Microsoft branded uh, PC uh, to do some upgrades. Yep, oh, of course. And, and by the way, they're not wrong about that. I have this argument with my sister all the time. She keeps wanting to use an old, I go to her house, she has this horrible old broken machine. And I say, I can't stand it. I'm buying you a new computer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He thinks you should keep using computers until they're worn out like shoes. And you just can't have that attitude. I, I well, my my sort of attitude is you, you use a computer um, until it starts to look like it's won't be worn out, and then you repurpose it into a router or a server or a display of some sort. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But you know, most of us spend our whole life working on a computer, and I figured out about ten years ago why am I using this piece of junk when this really is my main thing? I should get a good tool. And when I went to Max, and it's nice. They yeah. turn you upside down and shake out your money. You have to accept that. But if you're willing to pay the a lot amount, of, a large amount of money, it's really nice. It is, um, and I, I actually did one better recently because I got that uh, Lenovo that was mm -hmm. ridiculously overspec. But oh, oh my yeah. gosh, having a, a Windows PC that is overspec is actually a really nice experience. You know, most people I think go on Windows and, and they buy the cheapest hardware possible. And they just have kind of this hard time because nothing's working right. The mouse pointer is not all that great. The trackpad is, you know, rubbish. And then they try a Mac. And of course, Macs are like double, triple, quadruple the cost that they paid. And they're like, wow, this is such a better experience. Mm -hmm. But man, if you tried a PC with like 64 gigs of RAM, latest processor, no, you know, cost just as much as a Mac. I mean, the, the experience is actually really nice. <laughs> yeah, I've heard this. Yeah. And they used to have these super thin PCs too, the Ultrabooks, and they said they were really good. Well, I, the, a lot of the Ultrabooks, uh, or rather the the really cheap books that, that people bought that I guess got replaced by Chromebooks were actually- Those are the, net, those are the netbooks. Oh, ne oh yeah, the netbooks were, were kind of uh, into that. the previous thing where, where people yeah. were buying cheap hardware. And yeah, I used that for a couple of years. Yeah. But then they had the Ultrabooks, which were like $2,000 netbooks. They're basically a MacBook Air, but for Windows. 
and they were pretty nice apparently. Yeah, yeah. No, if if you spend as much money or usually a little less actually than you would on an equivalent Mac, you're you're gonna have a good time uh, yeah. <laughs> actually. So yeah, making that investment isn't isn't necessarily a bad idea. You get what you pay for. Yeah. All right. Well, then we're on with me. So I named the podcast Taproot. This is Bitcoin's big update just happened, Taproot. And I got a lot of cryptocurrency news. I've been following a lot of uh, cryptocurrency podcasts. I'm I'm getting less hatred towards it. They're starting to do stuff. Like, I think NFTs kind of make sense. I thought CryptoKitties kind of made sense. Um, anyway, so Taproot is where Bitcoin is going to move towards supporting smart contracts, among other things. And the main thing it has is a Schnorr signature which I don't really understand, but it replaces the elliptic curve, Diffie-Hellman signature, digital signature in the previous one. So I'm writing projects to get there. Um, and probably within a few days, I'll have that working and then explain what a Schnorr signature is. But the point is the signatures get smaller and it supports off-chain lightning transactions better and it should support um, smart contracts better, which is what those city coins do. They're smart contracts that run on Bitcoin. And so, um, it should be now this upgrade doesn't mean nobody will notice anything for years. That's what happened to the last one. It means the fundamental protocol has some new options, but nobody's going to use them until they update all the clients and wallets and everything. And it took a couple of years for people to actually use it. But anyway, there's more fun stuff here. Eleven billion dollars worth of NFTs were sold in the last quarter. And uh, there's a digital autonomous organization that formed in like two days and is raising $20 million to buy a copy of the Constitution. Apparently, the original draft of the Constitution, they made 13 copies to go to the 13 colonies. Two have been lost. There's only 11 copies left. There's only one that's not in a museum, and they are going to buy that one at an auction. And then they're going to like put it on public display somewhere and have a blockchain contract responsible for the club of people. I think this is a great thing to do so they can all vote and make sure it's properly cared for. So... Um, so did somebody call um, uh, Nicolas Cage on this? Yes. And of course, all the discussions in all the chat rooms are all full of Nicolas Cage memes. Absolutely. But anyway, they're going to totally buy the Constitution and uh, control it with a, with a robot overlord in charge of it instead of any humans. And then DeFi exploits, the amount of money stolen is $680 million, which is because, as we covered about a month ago, some guy stole $660 million and just gave it back. So that lowered the cost of crime in the last year to only 680 million stolen so far. So there's still an incredible amount of fraud and, uh, and abuse on the blockchain. I'm not as crazy enough to deny that. But I did go to Zero K Snarks and wrote a project on it. ZK Snarks, I've been hearing about for years. I finally figured them out and wrote a project for my students. This is actually what's going on with homomorphic computing, which is closely related. The point is you can prove something without gaining any additional knowledge. And one thing that's awesome about this is when you log in to a server, the current system is terrible. You log into a server, there's a secret you have, your password. You send your password to the server. You trust the server to throw that password away when it's done with it. And of course it doesn't have to. And this is what Mark Zuckerberg did. I was always amazed he never got prosecuted. In 2010, journalists started writing articles about Facebook and he wanted to know what they were saying. So he modified the Facebook login page to reject everybody twice before letting them in. So they would try all their passwords because everybody reused his passwords and to record the passwords. He could steal everybody's password. Any popular service could do this at any time. And he totally did in order to get into journalist emails account. And there's no reason to allow this. That's what ZK Snarks do. ZK Snarks, if you want to log in, you send a cryptographic object, which they can do math on to prove that you know the password, but you never send them your password. You can prove one fact without revealing any other information. So you could have a medical record and you could send a cryptographic primitive from that thing to people, which they could do math on to verify that you have been vaccinated against COVID or anything else you want to prove, but they would not gain any additional information. So anyway, they're well-established and not that hard to set up. And so I got a project where people do it. And so I'm going to I'm going to move more deeply into the cryptography behind the blockchain project because they are very interesting. The Schnorr signatures are interesting and the ZK Snarks are very interesting and they're at the heart of Zcash. Anyway, that's the stuff I've been doing. And so Caitlin, oh yeah, the, the, the Russians blowing up satellite. Yeah, so Reuters uh, has an article. Um, let's see, it was written by Tom uh, uh, Baumforth. 
uh, talking about how Russia is very proud of one of their <coughs> missile tests, which blew up an old satellite that was put up in 1983, I think. It was just an old satellite, it's soft working, and Russia is testing their satellite defense systems or space defense systems, which countries have a right to do. They have a right to defend themselves and test weapons, you know, and uh, they, they managed to blow up this, this satellite. Uh, so I have it here. It's the Selena uh, D, T S E L I N A. Selena, yeah, Selena D. And it's been in orbit since 1982. Dead, they blew it up. Uh, and Russia says, oh, it was just fine. Everything's good. Coincidentally, though, uh, there's another story here uh, by the National Post uh, written by, it um, uh, looks like it was also gathered from uh, Reuters uh, by Idiris Ali and Steve Gorman, uh, talking about how all the people on the space station were, I'm not, I'm not going to say evacuated, but for safety purposes, told to sort of stay in in the escape pods, essentially, and bucker down because there's a whole bunch of space junk coming from presumably the Russian missile tests, <laughs> and it put the space station in danger. Uh, and uh, like I said, Russia says, oh, there was nothing wrong, and it was just a perfect test, the best test. Everyone loved our tests. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, the, the, they're making the, the Americans are making this up. Now, I have, I have NASA tends to be sort of non political. You know, they just want the mission to succeed. You know, they're not going to fake a, 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 a crisis to, to make another country look bad. If they really think that, uh, that debris might hit the space station, they're, they're going to take precautions. Now, they're going to take plenty of precautions, right? There's no such thing as too many precautions in space because in space, if you make a mistake, uh, it can be pretty lethal. So they are being extra cautious, but it does show that we do need to be careful when we do our space weapons testing and, and everything. And uh, so far, the space station has not been hit. Uh, operations are resuming again as normal. So We'll see what comes of this. And, and supposedly because I imagine since the debris is close enough to the space station that it will deorbit rather quickly. Uh, the space station is not that high up in orbit. Uh, so it, there is gonna be some atmospheric resistance on that debris. So it's, it's but it is, is gonna be an issue. You know, you blow up one satellite and now you have thousands of little satellites that can hit your stuff, which is bad. Yeah, I was afraid this was, you know, going to be that really bad thing we talked about, the Kessler syndrome, where they smash into each other and you have a chain reaction and we're basically trapped here on this planet. Uh, that, that definitely could be the case. Um, like I said, it, it's low enough orbit that we, if, if that were to happen, if there was some sort of Kessler event where they blew up this one satellite, which is another satellite, which is another satellite, and, you know, the Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Yeah. Uh, for our, our biggest issue would would not be not getting into space. It's that it's that our critical infrastructure, a lot of our critical infrastructure, including Starlink, uh, is in low Earth orbit, which would be rendered inoperable. Um, and then we wouldn't be able to get into orbit for the next like five, ten years or so, and then we'd be fine again. But still, you don't want to be grounded for like five years. That sucks. Not for no good reason. Okay. Yeah. Good. But that has not happened. Is not as far as I know. That does not look like it's going to happen from this. But you just you really need to be careful when you are running your weapons tests. Also, if you are another country, just don't deny that you know you've made a mistake. Just admit it. <laughs> like you know, no one just you well, know. Russia didn't say they made a mistake. They said we have every right to do this. US did it, China did it, we're gonna do it too. We're blowing stuff up and you just stop whining about it. Yeah, here's the thing. Uh, yeah, the US did it, China did it, uh, India did it a few years ago, but none of them created a debris field that you know endangered the astronauts. Oh, the rest <laughs> that's of them the, like that's the difference. Oh. Uh, you know, and, and, and Russia is saying, oh no, our debris field didn't you know, uh, endanger the astronauts, yes. Yes, it did. Just admit it. Admit, admit you made a mistake and move on. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Learn from your mistakes. Well, that's not how things work in politics. Not very much. Anyway. All right. So Irvin has got Apple. 
Apple patches. Yes, Apple patches. Uh, so surprise, surprise, Apple is slow to update older versions of your OS. They're part of, uh, like Microsoft says, hey, you need to buy new hardware. Well, uh, Apple is slower to update the older ones. So like uh, in this case, uh, Catalina did not get an update that hit Big Sur for 234 days. Now, I thought Apple only supported one version back anyway. Uh, this was before uh, Monterey came out. Right, so I thought they would have just abandoned Catalina. Oh, no, no. Uh, before Monterey came oh, out, before Big Sur Monterey. Was okay, okay. Fair so Catalina was one back. And right, it took okay. 34 days time. for Catalina to get it. Yeah, well, that's pretty rude. So they aren't even supporting one back anymore, really. No, no. That's really. pretty harsh. <laughs> but I bet you make more money that way, which is probably why Microsoft is planning to do it. Mm hmm. Especially if you're selling the hardware. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty rude. Okay. Just an FYI. Yep. All right. And I was glad to see this. Pfizer has signed an agreement to forego all royalties and basically donate their anti-COVID pill to the world, like at cost or something. So it's um this is awesome. I mean, it should stop 90% of the people that are going to die from COVID of dying, which is fantastic. Um, and so uh Hopefully that can roll out pretty soon and help all the people dying of COVID in India and all over the world. So uh, good for them. Pfizer has really been a pretty heroic company in this. Anyway, and then Caitlin has got a memory leak in the Mac. Uh, you're on mute. Aha, I've been unmuted. Okay, perfect. Yes, memory leak in the Mac. Uh, this is a Pretty short story by Tech Republic, written by Brandon uh, Vidsliarolo. Uh, Vids I'm sorry, I messed up that person's name. Anyway, so on macOS, if you update it to, the, to macOS Monterey and you're using anything other than the macOS default cursor, you get these massive memory leaks apparently that just destroy your system, make it really slow. Et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and you know, no one knew what, what was causing it. And the Firefox people were, were the ones to point out what was the issue. Uh, so I, I assume, you know, Mac's gonna, Apple's gonna fix it soon. But yeah, now that's a pretty bad, uh, bad bug to have in your, your operating system. Yeah. That stupid yeah. mouse, you know, they should just not use a GUI and just use their terminal. Well, that's an option. You that know what I am? I, I, this is why I never upgrade in a hurry to Mac versions because they always have huge problems like this. And people are complaining about Windows 11 right and left too. Basically, I, I, one time I was a early adopter of operating systems, but not anymore, man. I got other things to do. Anyway. Um, I guess that everybody should just move to Linux. Well, that would solve all your problems. Absolutely. Except sound card issues. Yeah, that's why Alan is not with us. He can't get his sound to work because he's on Linux, which is, you know, that's that's what Linux is all about. Your whole life turns into a fun little CTF. Everything doesn't work, and you have to figure out brilliant solutions all the time. It's a great way to learn about computers, um, but not in the way that you would think. <laughs> you you learn a lot, but you also have to have a lot of frustration. Right. I mean, this, the, the, the difference between, like, Windows and, and other operating systems and Linux is that... Um, you know, Windows, you know, really tries to work just right out of the box and will continue to sort of work. Uh, but if it doesn't work, you know, you're kind of stuck in a, between a rock and a hard place. You're oftentimes going to have to reinstall the operating system. Linux, it's, stuff's not going to work, <laughs> but you always have the tools somehow to fix it or get around it. In principle, yes. it can, I remember when I joined the first hacking class, every single project was the product of like 36 hours straight of work. If it's pretty hard to fix stuff on Linux until you get good at it. And then it's still pretty hard. That is very true. But like I said, they do give you the tools. Well, yeah, in principle, you got control of everything. All right. Anyway, so um, I thought this was interesting. Irvin's got the, the Rittenhouse judge. Yes. Yeah, I could not believe what I was reading. So the judge thinks that by zooming in, on a video, 
the the iPad in this case would add more things to the video. Things that aren't there. That, that well, was his basic premise. Well, what I understood is that the defense said they thought that Apple uses some sort of AI algorithm or something to enhance the- No, the, that was the judge. I, I thought, no, I thought the, the defense made the, made the case and, and objected. And the judge upheld it because, you know, if there was no reason not to upheld it, basically, like if, if there's some question about the, um, uh, about whether or not the Apple devices can accurately reproduce or zoom into a video um, during a case that would have to get resolved uh, before you do that, before you zoom in and, and, and do that stuff, which is what the judge agreed with. I, I don't think the judge necessarily agreed that, yeah, no, the Apple absolutely uses AI, but that the defense's objection um, I don't see just simply defense. be upheld. I don't see the defense in this. It's, it's all the judge versus the prosecutor. No, I, I, I heard it. I, I'm with Caitlin on this. In fact, I was sympathetic with the judge. The judge said, it is possible that zooming in will change it, and you would need to put an expert on to testify that that doesn't happen. I see it. I see it. Okay. And yeah. I, that's why I added this other one. NVIDIA just added a deep learning super sampling routine to do exactly that for the images, to make them sharper by using AI to fill in extra stuff that's not there. So I think the judge is not wrong here. It is entirely possible that Apple uses some complicated system that fills in the missing pixels by guessing. In fact, they totally would. Well, at the end, the, the defense brought, or not defense, the prosecutor brought in a 4K TV connected to a Windows machine and said, here, there. Yep, but he couldn't zoom in. And in fact, Kyle Rittenhouse defended himself by saying, I can't really see whether I'm pointing the gun at people in that picture. And that yeah. was his defense. So in fact, he might have been better off to go get an expert to testify that he's allowed to zoom in, but he didn't do that. I think they had like a day to find a, an expert witness. Yeah. The thing is, do you really want to spend your time in this trial finding an expert witness so you can zoom in for some sort of questionable um, yep. boost to the defense, if any, right. or do you want to move on to something more relevant? Right, um, of course. Yeah. And that's his call. I, I mean, it looks to me like Kyle's going to get off largely. But anyway, we're going to see. Boy, they're sure ready for uh, protests and riots in Kenosha. Mm-hmm. Anticipating that whatever happens, people are not going to like it, which I think is probably a fair bet. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. All right. And I got, uh, I was amazed to see this. The Republicans now want to decriminalize marijuana at the federal level. So I hope it happens. I mean, it is ridiculous that we're locking people up over pot. I think you said the Republicans. I know they, I mean, think they'd be the ones holding it back, but even they have figured out this is nonsense. So maybe it'll actually happen for now. I remember every president, like Obama promised to do it, but if they find out when they go to Washington, that basically the South, the conservatives totally don't want it. And you can never succeed if you try to put that out there and, and they don't do it like Obama didn't do it. But Make, we'll see. This is the latest push. I would sure like to see it happen. I mean, I it doesn't make any sense to lock people up over pot, as far as I can tell. Mm. And it's ridiculous that we have our cops wasting their time arresting people and people rotting in prison for smoking pot. I mean, who cares? Let them smoke their damn pot. <laughs> anyway. And uh, Caitlin has got Visio. Right. So The Verge has an article written by Richard Lawler talking about how uh, Visio essentially makes most of its money off selling your data rather than the TVs it sells. So Visio is a rel relatively new TV manufacturer um, and they, they sell some pretty interesting TVs. Um, as far as I know, I think that they are, I think Visio might be Chinese. So I, I specifically sort of avoid them as a since the TVs are technically smart devices anyway. Um, but um, this article goes on to, to talk about how 
these television companies, particularly the ones that are, are selling TVs cheaply, are actually not making money off the TVs, but rather the data that it, it gets from you. And so there is this saying, I suppose, that back when social media started to become popular, that you know, if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. Well, in this case, you are paying for the product and you're still the product. <laughs> so so, so who's, who's buying it and what are uh, they doing with it? Uh, that's a good question. So a lo- much of it is ads. Uh, they are selling, you know, uh, so ad, ad spaces as well as uh, subscriptions. So they put ads on your TV. They don't come from like the broadcast mm-hmm. providers. Apparently they, I don't have a video. I can't confirm or deny, but apparently yes, they're getting a bunch, but the article does talk about ad revenue. They also of course are tracking what you watch for Nielsen quote unquote Nielsen ratings. Uh, to see, you know, what's popular, what could be popular, what people are doing on their TVs, so that media companies can then design uh, media around that. Um, and of course, they can um, also sell subscriptions to services like Netflix, uh, Disney Plus, Paramount Plus, um, uh, CompTIA Plus, yeah, CompTIA Plus, Net Plus, A Plus, all the all the all the television commercials or television. So they make twenty dollars per user per year from selling yep. your data. Yep. Well, and that's where the bulk of their profits come from. It's from selling data, even on things that you, you legitimately buy and own yourself. So you know, in Brave New World, they had the TV, but the TV was watching you, and that was the dystopian thing. And I think we're kind of we've kind of got that. Kind of, yeah. Uh, like I said, I I. Uh, I have to confirm this one second. But I believe Vizio is, uh, yeah, a Chinese company. Uh, so, well, oh that, no, they're headquartered in Irvin, Irvine, California. Yeah, if they were, if they're sending all the data to China, that would be even more hellish. Yeah. So apparently they're headquartered in Irv, Irvine. But there are a whole bunch of which, China. which is close enough to hell anyway. So, but there are a whole bunch hey. of things made in China. <laughs> Hey, I take offense at that. But do you disagree to, with it? No. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> Irvine, oh, I is, Irvine is just uh, in a weird part of uh, Orange County. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, you can see that you've got quite a tan down there. All right. Well, that's it for this one. And we will be back on Friday. <laughs>